So my name is Professor Washington Yoto Chiang. I'm the uh, current head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I'm also the Senior Security Science Fellow um, within the Institute for Security Science and Technology, ISST, with, here at Imperial College London. I am deeply honored um, to be one of the hosts for tonight's annual Vincent Briscoe Lecture. So please join me in welcoming Professor Hugh Brady, President of Imperial College London, to, to the stage to say a few words and to introduce our lecturer. Thank you, Washington. Um, good evening and welcome to Imperial College London. Uh, I'm Professor Hugh Brady, as been said. I, I'm uh, President of Imperial. The Vincent Briscoe Lecture is the annual lecture uh, for our Institute for Security Science and Technology, or ISST, as we uh, affectionately uh, know it. And tonight's lecture focuses on emerging and disruptive technologies. I joined Imperial uh, only last August, but, but part of the attraction uh, of Imperial, certainly for me, is that innovation and impact are very much part of Imperial's DNA. Our fantastic uh, students and staff continue to, to generate and to harness new knowledge on a daily basis um, to make our world healthier, safer, smarter, more prosperous, and more sustainable. ISST, our host this evening, is Imperial's hub for security research, innovation, education, and engagement. ISST's mission is to challenge the, the narrow perception of security, often viewed only through the lens of conflict, and demonstrate the breadth and depth of a topic that touches everyone in society, wherever they are in the world. As events over the past few years have shown, the interconnectedness of our modern world means that security shocks reverberate globally. Security cannot be an isolated endeavor. There is a burning need for new approaches that address this global nature of security and resilience, as hinted to in ISST's mission. Collaboration has got to be key to this, and it's why the ISST, under the leadership of co-director Professor Deep Chana, created the ISST's innovation ecosystem. It brings Imperial's academic community and major industrial partners, SMEs, and governments dedicated to looking at the next generation of solutions for global security and defense problems. It brings that diverse community together. It's wonderful to see the ethos of ISST's innovation ecosystem reflected in the recently announced NATO Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, otherwise known as DIANA. And we're thrilled that Imperial's White City campus, just a few miles from here, will house the European HQ for Diana, and that uh, Professor Chana has been appointed as the first managing director. I know I'm biased, but I think you chose very well. <laughs> now, central to the work of both the ISST innovation ecosystem and NATO, NATO's Diana is what's referred to as emerging and disruptive technologies. Those technological domains which are rapidly changing many facets of society, driving economic growth and having profound implications for our security. At the same time, as technology is a major driver of change, it is also becoming a key arena of global competition and a focus of governments who seek to harness and shape technological development through policy. Our guest lecturer tonight is perfectly placed to speak about this interplay between emerging and disruptive technologies and international co competition. We're absolutely delighted to welcome Ambassador uh, Mircha Jona, who became the NATO Deputy Secretary General in October 2019 after a distinguished domestic and international career that included, in no particular order, serving as President of the Romanian Senate, founding the Aspen Institute Romania, being uh, the OSCE's uh, chairperson in office, 
and serving as uh, ambassador to Washington. Ambassador Jonah is the first Deputy Secretary General from Romania, and indeed, the first from any of the countries that joined the alliance after the end of the Cold War. His lecture will explore how the nature of competition between the world's great powers is evolving in response to disruptive technologies. In an era, in an era of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and synthetic biology, how and where do the great powers compete with one another, and what are they competing for? Please join me in giving a very warm Imperial College welcome to Mircha this evening. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Brady. Uh, thank you so much for coming in such large numbers uh, for, for this very important event for me, my colleagues, and my family. Uh, they are here. Uh, my beautiful daughter, our great son, and our future son-in-law. Uh, so I hope, Garrett, that I will, uh, I will be making a good impression on, on all of you. Uh, uh, Ambassador Popescu, uh, my friends from NATO, and of course, I'll talk about Deep China later on. It was, he was a good choice indeed. Um, but if uh, Professor Brady um, is the first medic appointed as president of Imperial, I'm also the first engineer appointed as Deputy Secretary General of NATO. So I think we should eventually think of a startup together <laughs> in medical security, and uh, who knows where life will Will lead us in the future. Of course, of course, my, my deep my deep thanks go to uh, to Professor Deep Chana, to Professor Yoto Cheng, and for the Institute uh, for Security, Science, and Technology for hosting today's discussion. I know this has been a long and anticipated uh, and delayed engagement, but I'm delighted to be finally be here with you. In a country that has always been at the forefront of scientific breakthroughs in a city powered by its creative and commercial energy and at a college at the cutting edge of scientific research and world-class innovation. Imperial is one of the world's leading academic institutions, attracting students from all over the world. Imperial helps build more innovative and resilient societies every single day not least through your critical contributions to COVID modeling, testing, and treatments. And I know that the Institute is helping to forge the leaders of the future. And my lecture is especially for the young leaders in this room and the ones looking to us. Nothing more important than to prepare the next generation of leaders, especially in times of intense complexity and uncertainty. I also would like to, 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 to recognize, if there is any need, the very finest scientific research and innovation contribution you make for a more secure, more resilient, and more peaceful world. In fact, Imperial has and will continue to play a key role in NATO's own, our own innovation agenda. But I'll say something more about this in a minute. Let me start with a quick show of hands. And how many of you have heard about the new generation of generative artificial intelligence tools like ChatGTP or Google's Bard? Hands up. My goodness, we have unanimity on something. And have you used them? Keep your, keep your hands up, the ones who have used it. Well, I. We ran, together with my bright, young, and creative colleagues, a short test before coming here today with a simple question, what is NATO? And the answer is, and I quote from, from the result, a political military alliance established in 1949, true, with the goal of ensuring the collective defense of its members. Originally 12 countries, it now consists of 30 nations across Europe and North America. Tonight, we hope that from Ankara, we hear good news about the 31st ally, which, is, which will be Finland. 
and its core principle is that an attack on one member is an attack on NATO, an attack on all. And NATO has played, says artificial intelligence, played the major role in shaping international security and stability for more than 30, uh, 70 years. That's not bad. But we try something a little bit harder, a haiku. And the answer is, NATO's strength prevails. Allies united as one. Peace through cooperation. That's quite, quite smart. But then, and this was in a few seconds time. And then I go to the real test. How would this sound in my mother tongue, Romanian? Which is, I th even for a supercomputer or you know, uh, AI is not easy. And in Romanian it says, Putera NATO, Alianza Solidară, Pace prin Unire. It's right romantic. <laughs> but these are not just some clever tools that can speed up much of our daily life. What they are witnessing is the dawn of a new age of technological developments. And they have the potential to, to make our societies go through a massive revolution, like never, ever witnessed by human species. We say that today we are probably at a similar moment in recent history of human mankind when printing, press, or nuclear power were invented by our predecessors. Unlike these previous revolutions, however, Today's tech revolution is, would not be driven by a single breakthrough technology. It's a combination of them together. Thus, the additional complexity and unprecedented nature of the current technological revolution. A tech superstorm underpinned by data and artificial intelligence and ubiquitous throughout our daily lives from your car to your smartphone, to your home appliances, to the next generation of fighter jets. This is what the latest version of NATO's science and technology trends for 2023, 2020, 2043, which I was privileged to launch together with our NATO chief scientist, Dr. Brian Wells, and I thank you, Brian, for being here tonight with us. Just a few days in NATO HQ. That the combination of disruptive technologies like quantum, AI, biotech, and big data will present opportunities, but also massive challenges. The report also stated that 94 zettabytes of data were created last year alone. To put that in perspective, one zettabyte of data could hold approximately 20, 250 billion DVDs. Some of the young ones probably don't know what DVD is. <laughs> but for me, it was quite relevant for quite a long period of time. So this means that around 36 million years worth of high-definition video content. This was produced only last year. That number is set to double every two years, rising to nearly 100,000 zettabytes by 20 43. So currently only 0.5% of digital data is being exploited. So the possibilities seem literally endless. This has never, ever happened before. Today's extraordinary new technologies have the potential to, to make a revolution out of our lives and to help us tackle some of our most in intractable problems, from curing diseases combating climate change, transforming our economies, transforming our societies, our moral and democratic contracts. But there are also not only upsides to this. The potential for harm is just as great, if not even greater, than their potential for good. And this is also quite unique. 
You may have seen the news yesterday that the leaders of more than a thousand major tech companies are calling for a six-month pause, a moratorium, or advanced AI systems to allow the development of shared safety protocols and robust governance systems. In a world where potential adversaries are already attempting to shut down networks and critical infrastructure at the click of a button, or so discontent and disinformation through social media to destabilize our societies, we need to think differently about our use and how we use these technologies and how we keep our people and nations safe and protect our freedom, protect human dignity, protect who we are as human beings. This is what NATO is doing. And this is what I'm trying to tell you a few things about tonight. NATO itself is an extraordinary idea. It was created by our visionary founders who could see beyond the world as it was, towards the world as it could be. It was at the beginning of the Second World War. From the ashes of war, our founders have committed to build a common area of peace and security together. And they built it on our sacred promise to protect and defend each other, one for all and all for one. We are proud to represent the most successful alliance in human history. That's what NATO is. And our founders knew that without security, there is nothing, no freedom, no future, no lives, no innovation, no progress. Peace, security are the foundation of everything we do. And this is what NATO is all about. We see this very graphically and brutally today in Ukraine. For almost 75 years, NATO security guarantees have underpinned our peace, our prosperity, our democracy. And next April, when we'll mark our 75th anniversary in Washington, where this alliance was founded and we signed our founding treaty. And let me tell you one thing, especially to a young audience. We might get 75 of age. There is no early retirement for NATO anytime soon. Today, our alliance unites one billion people, two continents, and 30 allies and soon we'll have, tonight I hope, or next week, 31, and Sweden will come, we know, also shortly. Together, NATO allies represent half of world's military and economic might. Half of the world determined to defend one another and to help spread peace and stability for the rest. But the origins of our great alliance can be found in the Atlantic Charter. Early in the Second World War, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt met in Placentia Bay in Newfoundland off of the coast of Canada. And they drafted a set of fundamental principles, including self-determination, global economic cooperation, freedom from fear, and freedom of the seas on which the entire rule-based international order is based. The whole United Nations system, the European Union, and by the way, I still have the European Constitution original signing by my, I was also foreign minister, uh, uh, at home. Unfortunately, it failed, and I don't want to speak about this in, in, uh, here, uh, and this is not the sense of my lecture. But in fact, at moments of peril, these two visionary readers imagined a different proposition for humanity. And humanity was on the brink of precipice. So it didn't come only with solutions to win the war, but how to shape the world. And that's what leadership, my dear young friends, do represent. Not to cope with the problems of today, but to imagine a better future for you, for your kids, and your grandchildren, as I hope will be the case with my kids and my grandchildren, hopefully soon. <laughs> no pressure. 
But what we do now, what we do today, will determine what kind of world we'll be living tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And that's a very stark choice to make. A world ruled by fear and force or a world where every nation is free to decide its own destiny. That's, in fact, the challenge we have, all of us, in front of us. But the battle of ideas, which is shaping now in a new form for our generation and for today's world, is as old as human society. And the race to gain and maintain the technological edge has always defined who will come out on top. But never before have we witnessed the overlap between rising global competition and the breathtaking technological developments on such scope and scale. So technology is supercharging the bell of ideas itself. The question is, will it save democracy or further fracture it? Will technology be the ones making our species successful and fulfilling our immense potential or be part of the destruction? That's a fundamental question that we have to solve together. And that's why I'm here today at Imperial. This is also why NATO is determined to support Ukraine for as long as it takes to prevail as a sovereign independent nation. I know that many people, especially the young students from other parts than Europe, are saying this is a European war. That's about you guys, about the former colonial powers, and you're just always, this war is more important to you and others in around the world that are not as important as this one in Europe. I know these questions are there, and some of them are real questions. And this is not a conflict of regional interest for Europeans only. Because in this interconnected world, in a moment of such a transformation, the way in which the war in Ukraine will be won by Ukraine or by the other side will define not only the future of Ukraine or the future of European security architecture, will be defining the norms in which the whole world will be adopting and the behaviors in global affairs. So for the ones who are from a side and from afar, I know it's not the same emotion when you're living 10,000 miles away from Ukraine. But I tell you that the way in which we'll be prevailing and will prevail in Ukraine will be defining the way in which the whole world will be looking like. As our Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has said, what happens in Europe today could happen in Asia tomorrow. And other authoritarian regimes, be it in Beijing, be it in Tehran, could be in North Korea, they're all watching how the international community reacts to see the price Russia pays for its aggression or the reward it receives for its aggression. So Ukraine is a litmus test, and the repercussions of this war will shape global security and behaviors for decades and decades to come. So over the last year, NATO allies have provided financial, humanitarian, and military support to Ukraine worth to close 150 billion euros, including 65 billion euros of military support. Because by supporting Ukraine's right to self-defense, we are defending our own values and security. And President Biden said, this is not only about the future of Ukraine, it's about freedom itself. At the same time, NATO allies, I'd like to thank our British allies. We've been strengthening our own collective defense. In fact, since Russia illegally annexed Crimea and entered eastern Ukraine in 2014, we have implemented the largest reinforcement of our collective defense in a generation. So that when Russia launched its full-blown war of aggression, we were ready. 
NATO allies have shared precise intelligence about President Putin's plans for many months ahead of February 24, 2022. But despite our significant efforts, diplomatic, political efforts, to dissuade him to step back from the brink, President Putin chose to attack. It was Putin that walked away from the path of peace. Without, without hours of the invasion, NATO activated all of our defense plans and we strengthened our military presence from the Black to the Baltic Sea, backed by significant air and maritime power. We do all this not to provoke a conflict, but to prevent conflict and to stop this war from escalating into a full-blown war between NATO and Russia. The security crisis has driven historical developments in Europe and beyond. I mentioned Finland. They've abandoned decades of neutrality. Sweden, centuries, since 1812, centuries of neutrality. Germany has announced a true Zeitenwende, a turning point in its energy and security policies. Denmark has dropped its historic opt-out on European defense cooperation. Countries from Switzerland to Singapore have joined Europe and North America in the most far-reaching sanctions package ever applied to another nation. All of this was unthinkable before the war. And whatever was the calculus of President Putin before the war, believing that Ukraine is a nation that will not fight for its survival, or the West is decadent and weak, and the rest of the world do not react, he got it all wrong. The vibrations of Russian tanks are being felt as far away as Japan and Australia. Japan has announced a record increase in defense spending to 2% of GDP. I don't know how you call Zeitenwende in Japanese, but that's a symmetrical, if you want, response from a country from the Indo-Pacific to the same changed global security environment. Australia has signed an agreement with the UK and the US to strengthen the Indo-Pacific security under the AUKUS agreement. And historically, we welcome all four leaders from Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea to our NATO summit in Madrid last year, and we'll be very, very, very privileged to welcome them again at our summit in Vilnius, Lithuania, next July. But for the first time, in centuries, we face a formidable competitor in China that has both the intent and the ability to reshape the international order. Let me put it very clearly, we're not seeking and not seeing China as an adversary to us. We are not looking into a new Cold War. But the rise of China is presenting also opportunities, but also massive challenges. And it has the capacity and the intent to reshape the international order. And they have a policy of military civil fusion, meaning that Chinese state and military can use or misuse civilian data and technology. Chinese authorities are investing billions of dollars in AI, seeking supremacy in key technologies from quantum to biotech, batteries and 5G. And not just for economic gains, because economic competition and commerce, that's always something that all of us encourage. Competition is good. But also because they use it for political and military advantage. And this is already a different situation. For more than 20 years, Chinese authorities have been constructing the world's most sophisticated internet censorship system, the Great Firewall. And in the first speech of his pres president breaking third term this month, President Xi threatened a new great wall of steel to project China's interest abroad and protect its security at home. So the Chinese Communist Party is using all of its political, economic, and diplomatic tools to coerce and manipulate other countries, including our own, and to control its own citizens. And because this war has forced Europe 
to get away from our dependency on Russian energy. We should not replace one dependency to another. Today, China supplies 98% of the European Union's rare earth materials. All the while, and this is something that's of deep concern to everyone around the world, strengthening its no limits partnership with Moscow. And we see other authoritarian regimes coming closer together with Russia reaching out to Iran and North Korea for weapons. And to anyone who believes that authoritarian regimes offer a better way of organizing the world in its battle of ideas, of the fundamental principles of organizing human society, please do go and ask someone who lived under communism, do come ask your lecturer tonight. <laughs> and I will challenge any young men and women around the world not to give up on freedom, not to give up on democracy, as imperfect as it might be, on rule of law, on checks and balances, on keeping our politicians responsible of what they do or they don't do. Never trust the idea that someone on top can decide your destiny, how you organize your lives. Don't give up on your freedom. This is my plea to you. And of course, there is so much to be perfected in our world in our economic contract, in our social contracts, in our democratic contracts. We have so many things to do ourselves. But please, do not listen to the one saying that living in authoritarian regimes is more expeditious. No. This is lack of freedom, and this is NATO, is the opposite of lack of freedom. I also have a fantastic memory. Um, um, I was Romania's foreign minister when my country was accepted to join NATO. I think it was on April 2nd, this will be on Monday, 19 years ago. I was really crying. And there's a lot of rhetoric saying that NATO is encircling Russia. How can you encircle a nation of 11 time zones? And there was a sort of a American or British or Western European push for my countries, for our region, that just liberated from communists to join NATO. Not true. As a young ambassador, and my wife remembers how much we have been trying ourselves to get into this great alliance. So we have to really, really have this fundamental choice in our minds as we move forward. Throughout centuries, innovation has always shaped our security and has been the engine of our economic prosperity. From the bow and arrow to battle tanks, and from hand grenades to hypersonic missiles, new technologies combined with new thinking have changed the way we fought and won wars and they have underpinned our ability to shape successful and resilient societies. The war in Ukraine is much, as much a digital one, a kinetic one. Also, bits and bots are as important as bullets and bombs. So you, you, some people question, why has Russia not used more cyber attacks against Ukraine? Actually, they did. Just before the beginning of the war, they crippled through cyber attack the satellite communication system for Ukraine. And also they have attacks, cyber attacks on civilians and, and, and military infrastructures. We have also seen the use of Kinzhal hypersonic missiles. And also we are hearing with great concern the nuclear saber rattling coming out of Kremlin and Moscow more and more. Russia is still a nuclear superpower. And when you're a nuclear superpower, you also have responsibilities for refraining and restraint. And that's why in NATO, 
we are showing restraint because we know that this is a very dangerous road to go. But Ukrainian people are defending their homeland with incredible courage and skill. They've succeeded in pushing back the Russian invasion thanks in large part to their clever use of new technologies. This is the fusion between bravery, intelligence, technology, and training. Ukrainians are using facial recognition to identify Russian soldiers, 3D printed parts to bolster extending capabilities, artificial, artificial intelligence to intercept un, unencrypted enemy communications. A teenage boy from Ukraine became a national hero when he used a commercially bought drone to relay images on the advancing Russian tanks in the Battle of Kiev just a few days after the war started. Technology companies are playing a critical role in Ukraine. Both Ukraine's own well-developed tech sector, and there's a lot of talent in Ukraine, as well as big and small international players. They're helping bolster Ukraine's cybersecurity, providing high-resolution satellite images, and maintaining communications and internet access. This is truly unprecedented. Private companies taking a stand to become stakeholders in our security. It shows that the responsibility for our freedom does not just fall on the shoulders of our brave men and women in uniform. It goes far beyond that. Innovators, investors, scientists, brave journalists are all playing their part. There is even a ballerina from the Ukrainian National Opera who has swapped her ballet shoes for body armor and signed up to serve in the trenches. This is quite heroism in its purest of forms. Innovation has always been the driver of progress of human societies. Lord Sainsbury, David Sainsbury, has presented his dynamic capabilities economic growth theory, which puts innovation at the heart of progress of human society. An innovative mindset and the clever use of technology are key to outsmarting even the most formidable adversaries and solving some of our greatest problems and challenges. Defense has in turn also driven innovation. Vincent Briscoe, after whom this lecture was named, was an inorganic chemist who provided the first independent scientific advice to the British Security Service during two world wars. And Sir Alexander Fleming, after whom this beautiful lecture theater was named, discovered penicillin in 1928. This miracle drug was only mass produced after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. And it went on to save the lives of millions as the single greatest victory ever achieved over disease. Defense has developed many other medical breakthroughs, including prosthetics, burns treatment, ambulances, and ultrasound, and other everyday inventions from Velcro to duct tape, to the internet, the GPS, touch screens, and Siri. Long gone, however, are the days that these breakthroughs were driven by governments and delivered by large defense contractors. It is now the private sector and academia, the triple helix, st small startups, disruptors that are leading the way. Today, 90%, 90% of the dual use technologies used for defense and security are produced by the private sector. It's a huge change from the 70s and the 60s. The recent collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank was not just a shock to the financial sector but the signal that the current model of funding innovation needs to change. Three quarters of the world's $1 trillion GDP is still made up of traditional legacy industries, such as manufacturing, transportation, logistics, healthcare. This presents huge opportunities for their digital transformation, but also immense consequences for their resilience. And this also matters to our security. Your president was mentioning the fact that there is a new definition of security. It's way beyond defense and militaries. Everything we do. 
everything we do is related to our security. From climate change and security, from cyberspace and security, from outer space and security. Everything is do, we do is basically has a facet of our security. Economic security, supply chain security, intellectual property security, innovation security. This is a new broad definition of security where we cannot do it alone by governments or even big organizations like NATO, we have to do it all of us together. Also, this means that we have to solve our urgent security needs in a different way. We just cannot produce such results using the antiquated ways of doing business. And this is where also NATO has been at the forefront of innovation when it comes to security defense, and we are determined to stay there. Last year, we celebrated 70 years of science and technology in NATO. Our alliance boasts a network of some 5,000 scientists and engineers in our science and technology organization, and 5,000 companies in our industrial advisory group. This is the largest collaborative defense and secure research network in the world. And Brian Wells, Dr. Wells, thank you so much for being such an engine of such a massive, he's there, he's, he's Brit, he's a Brit. <laughs> yeah, there are many of them in NATO, <laughs> as, as they should. Also, speaking of our science technology organization, they are working on around 30, 300 research projects from how climate change is affecting anti-submarine warfare to the best protection gear for female soldiers and how to build trust in AI decision making to developing the next generation of fighter jets. We're having every year what we call an innovation challenge. An innovation challenge in NATO this year will be in Greenland, asking the young researchers and potential entrepreneurs to think about climate change and security. This is where NATO is going to, and this is where we need places like Imperial to go together with us. So I'm also honored to lead NATO's innovation agenda. I chair our innovation board at NATO, which drives new ideas and encourages the adoption of best practices around our NATO enterprise. Our alliance is blessed with excellent academic institutions, creative companies, and access to venture capital, the bedrocks of innovation. We have the very finest scientists and researchers and a wealth of talent from White City to Silicon Valley. And this audience is no exception. Together, nine of the world's top 10 universities are on allied soil, including Imperial College. NATO is home to almost 80% of all living Nobel laureates. 14 past and present laureates were students, professors, or fellows of Imperial. And more than half of the world's unicorn companies are from allied nations. Companies like Revolut and Improbable, a metaverse platform which offers virtual gaming experiences also for the defense sector. They were started by Imperial alumnus. Our $7 trillion transatlantic economy is the largest and wealthiest market in the world. US and Canada and European companies have developed a dense web of deep transatlantic connections over many decades. And our free and open societies allow talent to thrive, people to create, and finance to flow freely. There is a direct link between freedom and innovation. There is a direct link between innovation and freedom. We have the resources and expertise to solve some of the day's most difficult problems. But to stay ahead, we must disrupt or be disrupted. This is what we do at NATO. We're also trying to do things differently at NATO. In 2021, we agreed a new strategy and roadmap to the embrace the opportunities and mitigate the risk of new technologies. We are focusing on nine priority areas. AI, autonomy, biotech, quantum, energy, propulsion, and space. 
and we are developing specific plans and strategies for each of these areas. We have also launched two groundbreaking initiatives, and this is one of the reasons why I'm here today. The Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, or DIANA, and the NATO Innovation Fund. DIANA will help us to develop deep tech, the Innovation Fund, to invest in it. Both are radical departures from the old ways of working, less bureaucratic, more agile, much more effective, and run like in the private sector or in the finest academic institutions. We want to go where no one expects us to go and not wait for the answers to come knocking on our door. We want to be out there where the real innovation is happening, to source wide, pick early, and work with the best. This is why Imperial's Wide City Campus has been chosen to host one of Diana's two regional offices, along with Canada for North America, and a regional hub in Estonia. Imperial's Innovation Hub already co-locates major defense contractors alongside the UK's Defense and Security Accelerator and US Department of Defense Tri-Service Office. The magic triple helix of government, industry, and academia at work. I was delighted to officially open Diana's London office earlier today with the Minister of Defense Procurement, Alex Chalk. And I'm deeply honored that Professor Chana will take up his role as a Managing Director of Diana from April 1st. Deep has been a driving force for NATO's innovation agenda, not least as the chair of our advisory group on disruptive technologies. Deep, I'm incredibly grateful for your leadership, and I know that you'll be doing an immense positive job in your new capacity. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your leadership. I hope I'll get as many as applauses at the end. <laughs> Diana will, at the end. Uh, Diana will work also directly with cutting-edge commercial startups and innovators to solve critical defense and security challenges. It will leverage a network of almost 100 test centers and accelerators across NATO countries. So imagine you are a young, smart entrepreneur coming, let's say, from Imperial. And you have an idea on a technology that could also be dual use. And you could choose, of course, go at Imperial. It offers, I think, an almost holistic ecosystem of innovation and testing your ideas. But you can choose from other 99 centers across NATO countries with various capabilities and specialties. And you can really go and test for free your idea through Diana. And then if this idea makes sense, then you can really go to the Innovation Fund in NATO and get some, some, some early funding for your idea to be mature, and then you go to the real venture capital markets and with, with equity still with you and develop what we call, and my ambition is to have the next generation of NATO unicorns coming out through this cooperation of government, academia, and young innovators. Let me give you an example of what we mean by dual use. In 2017, US Navy officers were complaining that the controllers used to operate periscopes on submarines were too clunky. So the Navy replaced the traditional helicopter-style joysticks with Xbox controllers. Not only they were dramatically cheaper, but they radically reduced the training time from hours to minutes. <laughs> so innovation does not have to be expensive, has to be just clever. Last December, NATO stakeholders and allies identified three priority areas for Diana for this year. And we'll be launching the first challenges pretty soon, Deep. Energy resilience secure information sharing, because data transmission in the 
era of quantum will become decisively important. And sensing and surveillance. So energy resilience is about ensuring that energy is sufficient and available at all times to sustain NATO's missions and operations. Secure information sharing is about ensuring protected, reliable, and shareable data. And sensing and surveillance is about detecting and observing changes in physical and digital domains for better situational awareness. Just last week, we announced that Diana will kick off its pilot accelerator program in collaboration with leading accelerator sites in Boston, in Copenhagen, in Seattle, in Tallinn, and in Turin, Italy. We'll publish calls for applications to participate in the program this June. And I expect the first startups to join by the end of this year. And I hope I stimulated your curiosity and interest in joining this challenge. At the same time, we recognize the difficulties in sourcing the long-term secure investment needed to make sure that great ideas make it across the valley of death. And this is why we are launching also this year the NATO in the Innovation Fund. This is the first of its kind. It's not huge, it's just one billion euros, but it's the first, it's the first multi sovereign venture capital fund. Sounds a little bit tense? It is not. Because we believe we have an obligation to help the young startups to, to go through this very difficult period between an idea and the market in the best possible conditions. So this is something that we are very proud of, and it also shows the agile way in which NATO is investing in innovation. It's also we invest trusted capital into startups with the potential to develop commercially successful dual-use technologies. And in time, we expect these ideas and these startups to attract billions more euros in private investment. The Netherlands will be hosting the headquarters for the fund's investment management arm. We are, as we speak, recruiting from the professional venture capital professionals the leadership for the innovation fund of NATO. We'll start investing the first chunk of money in the second half of this year. So NATO is not only committed to innovating differently, we also want to innovate responsibly. Most new technologies now in the making are not regulated at all. AI, big data, cyberspace, climate change security, biotech, human enhancements are all being developed in a kind of no man's land. And of course, governments try to somehow regulate and find some, some, some balance. In many of these things, there are no universal norms to govern those. And if we don't write the rules of the road, others who do not share our values will. We do not just want to stay ahead of the curve. We want to make sure that the curve moves in the direction of progress, of freedom, and the rule of law. This is what defines us as an alliance, what sets us apart from our competitors. And I'm happy to see here a distinguished member of the NATO advisory group, Maria Luciana Accente, who is one of the top specialists on ethical use of AI. And I'm very happy to have you together with other friends in the advisory group in NATO. So this is not about stifling innovation, but about enabling it. It's about creating a predictable, trustworthy, and responsible environment where everyone, innovators, end users, and our public opinions feel confident cooperating with the defense sector. So NATO is putting principles of responsible use at the center of our approach. Principles like lawfulness, accountability, traceability. We are applying this to artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. I know for the young people, some of these are of this deep, serious, and legitimate concern. We are applying this to artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, and everything we'll do in the future. You can look at NATO as one of the key promoters and users of responsible use of new technologies. To biotech, to human enhancement. And these are only the two strategies we are developing during the year of 2023 at NATO. We are also putting these principles into practice. 
and we'll, we'll take sustainability into account in line with our climate change and energy objectives. Last month, NATO launched the world's first international review board to address the ethical risks arising from the use of data and AI. And this board will define its own standard for the responsible use of AI for defense and security later this year. NATO is supremely placed to be a global driver of a value-based innovation. Our ambition is to set a gold standard on the ethical use of new technologies for defense in NATO and around the world. But we also know that we cannot do all this alone. This is why you come in, innovating quickly and responsibly in this time of profound digital transformation will require all of our talent, all of our commitment, all of our dedication. Like Prime Minister Churchill and President Roosevelt, we need a new Foundland, but one that combines all of our vision and leadership. And we need that not only from leaders from one or two nations, but we need this from the citizenry and for the leaders of this world. And I will close with my message again to, to my young, I hope, new friends in this audience. Of course, the, 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 the grown-ups are also included. <laughs> I know that sometimes NATO has a relatively simplistic view from our citizens, defense, security, war. In fact, we are political, democratic, and value-based organization. And we are not ensuring only the peace and security of everything we do inside NATO countries, the one billion people. But in a way, the way in which NATO acts and transforms and innovates is an indispensable piece of global peace, security, and system of norms. I'm so privileged from a young kid from communist Romania, an engineer at the beginning. The offer is still on. on. <laughs> to see my country and my part of the world and our alliance moving forward. But my plea to you, and this is the message of my lecture here, this is prestigious university. We need you. We need you to help us think afresh. We need you to help correct our mistakes. We need you to trust that democracy and freedom and rule of law is and will continue to be the best way to organize human societies now and in the future. You know, I'm already a generation that has been seeing many things in my life. You, my young friends, will be seeing even more trepidation and transformation in your lifetimes, in your careers, in your life, in your personal lives. There is something that has to keep us together, and these are our values and our ideas. And when you think of NATO in the future, I hope that will make you tonight think of this organization I'm so proud to represent and so privileged to work on innovation on behalf of NATO as the foundation of peace and security and everything else you do. This is NATO, that's who we are. And I'm profoundly grateful and humbled to be at Imperial College to give this lecture tonight. Thank you so, so very much.